Hi, and welcome to In The Zone, our series of interviews from the Middle East Treaty Organization, MATO, digging underneath the debates around banning weapons of mass destruction from the region. And I'm Paul. And remember, eradication of WMD is possible. It's a matter of political will. Now, today, we've got Imad Kiei back into the MATO virtual studio specifically to give a primer on the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. So, Ahmad, I'm going to start with the first question, and it's going to start pretty basic in terms of what actually is the GCPOA and what it's what is its purpose? Why did it even come about? All right. Thanks for having me. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is known as the JCPOA, or for now onwards, we will just call it the Iran nuclear deal. It's an agreement, a multilateral one between the world powers, which includes uh, Russia, China, United Kingdom, France and the United States, plus Germany in agreeing to make sure that Iran's nuclear program is peaceful and does not divert or build nuclear weapons. Now, this agreement came about after two years of earnest and accelerated discussions that began in 2013 and finished off in 2015 when the agreement was signed off by all the parties involved. Now, what it did was for the first time, after many years of back and forth on how do we deal with this international concern over Iran's nuclear program, achieve something that was quite a remarkable piece of document, 159 pages to be exact. And it made sure that Iran's nuclear program is under supervision by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a nuclear watchdog that makes sure that what this agreement has been done with these world powers is implemented on all the program of Iran. And that goes on to all the facilities that Iran has that deals with the nuclear domain. And it's under 24 seven watch. So we know now after this agreement that Iran is by far the one countries, the country in the world that is under the most comprehensive inspection that has ever happened in the history of nu nuclear non-proliferation. So Imad, let, let me leap in there because, uh, and, and this is a question that may not appear obvious to people in the West, but you know, why did Iran agree to this? Because uh, I, I can't imagine any Western country agreeing to the same level of uh, inspections and uh, verification and uh, exposure that the Iranians seem to have agreed to in this uh, nuclear deal. Paul, that's a great question, because a lot of Iranians are also thinking the same thing, that Iran has a nuclear program and has the right to a nuclear program as a signator to what is known as a nuclear non-proliferation treaty that allows four countries to develop their peaceful uses of nuclear technology. And so um, Iran has been advancing in this field for many reasons, but the global powers have suspicion that Iran wants to build nuclear weapons. Now here, Iran is saying, listen, we are an open book. Come check out our facility and see that we are actually not trying to build a nuclear weapon. Now, the reason why Iran got into these negotiations is because of three primary reasons. The first one is that there has been enormous amount of economic sanctions imposed on Iran because many countries and some who are seen as adversary to Iran see it as a way to punish Iran for actually developing its nuclear program. So there's an issue of power balance going on here. Number two is the fact that Iran wants to actually showcase to the world that it is a legitimate country with a program that is peaceful and there should be no double standards. And by showing that uh, everything is clear, is their way to say that, listen, there is no smoking gun here, so carry on. And number three, it's important as a sense to also find a diplomatic solution to remove these sanctions and this international isolation because the alternative to it, frankly speaking, is war. So Iran has made the calculation that instead of war, it's better to speak and negotiate a way out of this dilemma. Could I ask, why is it, do you think, that so many international stakeholders have focused in on solely Iran for this kind of high, intense level of oversight over what they do with their nuclear facilities and nuclear capabilities? Why is it Iran specifically? And I hate it. The, the truth of the matter is that there are uh, some parties or uh, countries or groups that see Iran as a major threat to their own security. 
And this is based on the fact that, for example, Iran and the United States haven't had a diplomatic relationship for over 40 years since the 1979 revolution that happened there. So there's a level of animosity, there's a level of mistrust, and there's a level of miscommunication between a regional power like Iran and a global power like United States. And so when you're the enemy of the United States, ooh, it is not an easy way to wiggle your way out of it. And we have seen what the adversaries of the United States end up in the case of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, in case of Libya with Gaddafi uh, and the current turmoil with North Korea. And of course, not to forget Cuba in all of this mix. So um, I think primarily is that the suspicion is coming from a lack of communication and relationship with this power like United States. And then to make things more complicated is that there are some countries in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Israel, who have an oversized influence on Washington's foreign policy towards the Middle East. And whereby they see Iran as a regional threat or a national security threat. And by extension, through their lobbies, through their influence, through their relationship with the United States, make sure that the United States carries on placing this pressure on Iran. So unfortunately, it's coming from all across uh, the field in terms of why there is so much uh, mistrust on Iran. Okay, Imad, Ima, um, that's the international perspective. Can we drill down into Iran itself uh, from your perspective? Uh, what's, what's going on in Iranian politics today? We've got a presidential election coming up soon. Uh, and uh, there's been debates very strongly inside Iran about the future of the nuclear deal, which itself hangs in the balance. What's, what's your sense of, uh, of where things are at in the debates within Iran itself? Iran is a complex nation, um, one that uh, many people want to cookie cut into a one simple understanding of how the politics works in Iran. But there is quite a spectrum of political thought uh, in terms of how we move forward with key national security matters. And in Iran at the moment, there are three schools of thought. Those who are in the current administration of the Rouhani government, who believe that diplomacy is still the way forward in addressing the nuclear issue and opening Iran to the international community and rebounding the Iranian economy in the process. The other school of thought that is quite dominant is the one that is carried by some members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and also the conservative bodies within the government who believe that this interaction with the, with the international community, by opening up Iran's nuclear facilities, by giving up all of these concessions under the nuclear deal and to uh, withstand the increasing sanctions and the mistrust that has come about by Trump pulling out of the deal is no longer viable for Iran to continue. That Iran has made all of these commitments and in, instead of receiving carrots or rewards, has been increasingly receiving more, more of sanctions and other primitive uh, actions. So they believe that we should actually uh, forget about the West, engaging with Europe and the United States and put our uh, um, eggs in a basket of the emerging powers of Russia and China. The third school of thought is that actually what is in matter here is a, a sort of like a middle ground where we can still interact through the UN uh, framework for uh, multilateral negotiations but to increasingly redirect our, our emphasis on having domestic independence on all the fields that are important for our national security and to build up closer relationships with these other, again, emerging powers and for outside. So going to the South American countries, uh, expanding to Africa, to Central Asia, and to see the world through the prism that is not so much Euro or US centric, but instead more towards the rest of the world that is also emerging as powerful players on the international scene. Thank you, that was really interesting. I mean, you've covered in terms of within Iran why it is that there are some benefits to staying in line with a treaty like this and why they have interests in staying involved. With the US, for example, and other regional states, you've mentioned that they all do have a stake in this. They all do have their reasons for being involved. So why was it that there were actually objections from a lot of regional states and hardliners in the US who didn't think involving themselves with Iran on a treaty like this was actually for the benefit? 
Well, you know what? I wish it was uh, that uh, these uh, individuals or groups would have read carefully this 159-page document because the nuclear deal is not just about Iran's nuclear program. This is a, you know, an open secret that actually what is happening is that Iran is engaging with world powers on a key, uh, key issue. And just the fact that these negotiations are happening opened up the door for Iran to then engage on not just the nuclear fire, but for the international community, United States and European powers to also engage Iran on a broad spectrum of matters. May that be the refugee crisis that is happening in the region to the wars that are happening where Iran has direct or indirect influence on Yemen, on Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. So it is not just Iran's nuclear program. If we have a diplomatic solution, and if we have engagement by Iran with the international community, there's something that's going to happen here, is that the regional power of Iran and influence of Iran is going to be on the rise. And that comes, unfortunately, from a narrow perspective at the cost of other regions regional powers influence as well. And we see here that the United States relationship with uh, UAE, with Saudi Arabia and Israel, from their perspective, from those who are, you know, against the nuclear deal, they see that if Iran and the US actually sit down and speak to each other and normalize their relationship, it will be at the cost for them. And don't forget, this is quite a good business to have a boogeyman in the region. Uh, the majority of United States uh, arms exports goes to the Middle East. It is these rich Gulf Arab countries who are buying uh, expensive American weaponry and European ones too, don't forget. So here, there's an economic cost to those who are making money out of this animosity and instability. There is a power issue whereby they can lose power if Iran becomes a normal uh, oper you know, cooperative nation in addressing these challenges of regional security in the Middle East. And finally, it also takes away their domestic excuses that they use to uh, see Iran as a threat. A, a case in point here would be Netanyahu's government in Israel, who uses Iran for their domestic election <laughs> sort of uh, promotion. Like, be careful, if you don't have Netanyahu in power, the Iranians are coming. We've spoken a lot about Iran's compliance with the treaty and keeping Iran in check and keeping this oversight in terms of whether or not they abide by the terms. And I think I'm quite interested to know what it is that we can actually really expect from Iran in terms of its compliance when, for example, the US, such a key stakeholder in this treaty, has a track record of, for example, the assassination of Soleimani, really significant events that threw the progress of this treaty off significantly. Iran is in a difficult position. Iran's economy is under great strain. And as you correctly pointed out, when uh, one of the key uh, um, signatories to the Iran nuclear deal, the United States, made a un unilateral decision in 2018 under Trump, and, uh, Trump presidency to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal, a key pillar of this agreement was removed. And let's not forget, it's not just that it's the United States. It's the fact that the global economic financial uh, system primarily runs through uh, United States and New York specifically. So when the US placed its own unilateral sanctions on Iran, it's not just the uh, US, then it goes to its, Iran's key trading partners, may that be the Europeans or the Asian countries and says, listen, you trade with Iran, that's fine, but then we're gonna close you up to our economy. And so it uh, makes Iran, unfortunately, uh, not be able to uh, um, carry on uh, functioning on, in, in the international commerce uh, areas. So it's not just the fact that the U.S. pulled out. It's the, it's the fact that in increasingly we're having these conversations within Iran that says, what's the point? What's the point? But here I want to remind you that for Iran, the Iranian nuclear deal agreement was based on three key reasons. One is let's get this UN Security Council sanctions that are broad in terms of all the nation states have to abide by removed. Let's check mark on that. Number two, we want to make sure that the European Union removes all of its sanctions on Iran. Uh, and that also occurred. Check mark on that. And number three was hopefully 
the, the impetus was that if this agreement is followed through and we can keep it and sustain it, that not only will the US sanctions on Iran be removed, which was initially done so, but also then open up the conversation for normalizing relationship between US and Iran. On this last point, it is now in jeopardy because the US pulled out. And so uh, we are hoping that in the current discussions that are happening today in Vienna, uh, in uh, some, uh, uh, bringing back all the parties to the nuclear deal, that the new administration in Washington, the Biden administration realizes that it is important, not just for the Iran nuclear deal that the US returns to its commitments under the JCPOA, but for their own credibility in the international arena for uh, uh, carrying forward and um, complying with what they agree. It is not Iran that has to actually be the one who's supposed to build trust here. It's the US. They're the ones who pulled out. They're the ones who uh, damaged the credibility of multilateralism, of agreements, of treaties. So it's important to um, place the um, blame and also the responsibility on the right parties here. And I believe that the US has a lot of answering to do to its own people, to its own government, and to the rest of us. Okay, man. I love your passion. <laughs> now, just uh, just uh, nipping in there, can I can I turn the spotlight from the US to the Europeans? Um, because uh, the Europeans have, for now, fifteen to twenty odd years, uh, prioritised Iran as as its it, as its flagship uh, foreign policy uh, objective within the common foreign and security policy, which itself is quite an interesting decision that they mm. took some time ago. Um, they haven't really played quite the same role uh, as the Americans and other members of the international community. They've they've tried to stick by the by the deal, but they've also tried to stick close to the Americans. And uh, how much do you think they've succeeded, uh, or how much do you think they've been outmaneuvered um, by either the Americans, the Iranians, or indeed the Russians and the Chinese? The European parties to the Iran nuclear deal also have a lot to do. Yes, on paper, they have remained committed to the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, they have removed the sanctions that we were talking about. Um, but in reality, uh, they've not been able to actually withstand and stand up to the actions of the United States in derailing the Iran nuclear program, uh, Iranian deal. And here, I think the Europeans have uh, a, actually a lot of options on their hands to be able to safeguard this agreement and also strengthen it because they play a bridging role. They have good relationship with the United States and, and their ability to influence Washington in terms of why this is so important. And for the Europeans, uh, keep in mind that for them, the Iran nuclear deal is also, it, it brings to the fore the importance of multilateralism. And the European Union as a project is built upon multilateralism. It is the biggest project of multilateralism. So for them, diplomacy and multilateralism is key to be at the forefront of how do we deal with international concerns and so for the uh, European Union and for other European parties to this deal. It is important that they use the instruments that they have. One is that there are a, a huge economic powerhouse uh, that can actually uh, be able to um, um, uh, satisfy the economic needs and the incentives that Iran was hoping to receive from the Iran nuclear deal. Now, they've taken some steps like what is known as INSTEX, which is this financial instrument that bypasses the US by allowing Iran and the European uh, countries to trade. Now, they need to actually make that stronger because since they've done that, maybe a handful of transactions have gone through it. And this is ridiculous. The European Union has gone through all the effort to build the infrastructure to allow for trade between Iran, legitimate legal trade between Iran and the European Union. And you call the office in Paris and nobody picks up. There's a problem with that. I'm sure they can do better than that. And then politically, they shouldn't just put their words uh, and nice words to their commitment to the JCPOA. They should actually, for once, be able to say we have the backbone to stay true to our own principles and values and to safeguard multilateralism and an important non-proliferation agreement that can make sure that we do not have these weapons of mass destruction proliferate. 
in the most troubled, instable region in the world. Great, thanks, Imad. A, a final question. Um, what do you think are the top two or three lessons that you would draw from all of this experience around the nu nuclear deal uh, for those of us trying to build a, a, a constructive and cooperative WMD free zone across the region? Firstly, diplomacy does work. Don't give up. Uh, the alternative to what has happened uh, with the Iran nuclear deal would have been what we saw in Iraq over its weapons of mass destruction program that resulted in a devastating war. So the fact that we have a deal and the one that we need to safeguard shows that diplomacy and multilateralism actually can be an alternative to war. And that's key for us to remember and to push and to strengthen. So diplomacy, multilateralism. Number two, the lessons that we can learn is that trust building takes time. But once it's achieved and once it's verified, as Obama would famously say, it allows for a common ground to be built so that we can actually have a platform of dialogue whereby it's not just on Iran's nuclear program, but on an array of issues that cooperation and collaboration is the future of our global community in addressing really important issues that will be life or death circumstances for our human race. And finally, what I would like to say that the lessons learned from this is that when the trust is broken, in the case what we saw with Trump administration pulling out of the deal and other multilateral agreements, it is important for those other international community, other global powers to actually have the moral high ground and stand there and say, we will not let this happen on our watch. That we will not use the usual double standards of demonizing a country like Iran. Instead, we're gonna hold it to account, even powers such as the United States in what they have done in terms of dismantling and weakening the instruments that we have in our hands to uh, basically avert Armageddon. Thanks, Imad. I think that's all the, we've got time for today. Uh, what a what an incredible skate through all the issues. Uh, and of course, we could carry on going for it all day. Um, it's great passion that you bring and I really enjoy working with you. So thank you so much, Imad, for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen to another episode of In The Zone. Just a reminder that you can find us online at www.wmd-free.me where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money or even volunteer to work with us. And we're also on social media. Our Twitter and our Facebook and Instagram handles are wmdfreeme. Our podcast episodes are bi-weekly uploaded on our SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube and you can find the links to those on our website as well. And we'll catch you next time. <laughs>